Since its launch in 2005, Israeli Apartheid Week has grown worldwide. Can you tell us how you've seen it evolve in your country? It has really been incredible to see um, how it has developed. When we first started Apartheid Week in uh, Toronto, there was no way we would have imagined uh, that it, it would have grown to be this big. It started out in one city, one university, uh, then grew to 25, 40, and last year it happened in 97 cities. We don't have the count for this year because cities are still coming in. I still remember the initial debates we were having where people said, why don't you call it Israel a Palestine Awareness Week? Why don't you focus on the occupation, not the apartheid analysis? Uh, but a lot of us that were actually there at the time were Palestinian refugees uh, and Palestinians from the diaspora. And we insisted if we only speak about the occupation, we're not speaking about the majority of the Palestinian people, the refugees. So let's begin to think of Israel through this lens, a new type, not just analogy, but analysis that leads us into boycott, divestment, and sanctions. The year after that, the BDS call came from Palestine, signed by 170 Palestinian organizations. It was exactly the catalyst we needed to say, so here's the analysis, here's the action. We put them together, and since then we've been doing it every year. But every year I say I'm really ready for Israeli apartheid to end because February has been stolen from me like the rest of Palestine. <laughs> Uh, at the moment in the country, it's taking place in about 11 universities, uh, which includes the traditional uh, strongholds of the Palestinian Solidarity Committees. Uh, so University of the Witwatersrand, University of Cape Town, uh, and uh, we've got new universities as well, like Rhodes, like uh, 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 University of Johannesburg. So uh, it's grown incredibly uh, big. It hasn't happened yet in South Africa, uh, but I, I mean, we are we are we are expecting uh, to to have a very huge support. And the longest, the biggest uh, historic student movement, South African Student Congress. Uh, last year in its uh, annual national conference adopted IAW as its program uh, and, uh, and that's one of the most important successes is that SASCO is behind it uh, in full force and we are getting also organizations outside of the uh, traditional student cohort uh, to, to, to endorse it as it were. And I think that even in the, in, the, in the few coming years, we're going to see it infiltrate in, into even communities. For an example, south of Johannesburg, um, there is a township settlement called Orange Farm, which um, it's one of the, the most recent uh, settlements. It was, I think, uh, late 80s, 89, when Orange Farm came to be. Uh, the African National Congress branch in Orange Farm is called the branch of the, the, the Palestinian branch in the Greater Palestine. Uh, so, and, and that's the idea, a, a, a really powerful uh, uh, IAW, in my view, is one that will be based in the working class communities in South Africa. So, and I think that we're going to make headway in that regard. What would you say to anyone still unsure about using the term apartheid when it comes to Israel? The word apartheid is about separateness. You know, it's a community somewhere in the face of the world which wants to create itself uh, which wants to separate itself, which wants to create, uh, in South Africa it was about creating a white only people's, white people's only society at the expense of the indigenous people. Is that that realization of that white only society was at the expense of the, was at the expense of the indigenous community and also with the full ignorance of the history of colonialism and slavery. So uh, uh, that's where the ideological basis, the political basis of apartheid is not necessarily in the law. The legal apparatus is its expression as opposed to where it begins. So Israel is a bloody apartheid state. That's what it is. It is a society that wants to create a Jews-only political community and, uh, and at the expense uh, of Palestinians on one hand, but also with a full ignorance of the history of uh, colonialism the history of, uh, 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 of, the in, of, of, of the injustices and the dispossession of the, uh, of the Palestinian people. But what makes it worse? Uh, for me, I think uh, that's where the, the debate should be going now. What's, what makes Israel worse than apartheid is the whole question of refugees, is the whole question of the right of return. We, we never faced uh, that predicament. We were always within the geographic space, uh, but although they were annexing it uh, more and more, but the, the ridiculousness of the of the Israeli government uh, that makes it worse than apartheid is the question of the right of return and refugees. When people use terms, uh, the, the framework of apartheid in the context of Israel-Palestine, uh, they're either 
they're, they're doing two things. They're either one, talking just about the situation in the West Bank and Gaza and normally typically about the kind of regime in the West Bank you see to do with the settlements and the roads and, and all, all that sort of thing. Uh, and they're not, and they're excluding anything that happens outside the occupied territories. Or, and this, is, this latter category is what I would place myself in, they're talking about it in terms of one territorial unit that includes all of Mandate Palestine, that includes all of Palestine Israel. In other words, it's a reflection of the fact that Israel controls all of, all of that area. Right? It, include, it controls all that area, and under its regime, different groups of people are afforded or denied different sorts of rights on an ethno-religious basis. Uh, so that's why, that's why you end up bringing in issues facing Palestinian citizens of Israel too. It also is a framework actually which enables you to talk about the refugees as well, uh, because they are people who are deliberately excluded from that territorial unit by the same regime uh, that uh, discriminates uh, within, within the area that it controls. Um, so there's a legal framework to be using, uh, there's a political analysis, you know, kind of a socio-political analysis that you can use to talk about it. Uh, but in terms of uh, not just describing what's happening on the ground, but also being a foundation for uh, a vision for change, I think that's why it's most useful uh, when it comes to that issue of thinking about it as a de facto one state that exists. And the question being, what kind of state will that be? Just a few days ago, the uh, Jerusalem Post uh, published a story entitled Envoys to Fight Israeli Apartheid Week on Campuses. What does it say about the movement and what does it say about Israel itself? Firstly, I think it shows that Israeli Apartheid Week is successful. I think the fact that today Israel has to train people and pay people to defend it from the, from the claim that it's an apartheid state means that finally the debate is happening on our terms. It's not that there's a massacre somewhere and we Palestinians have to go on the streets and demonstrate. Uh, it's also not about security and terrorism, which is the framing Israel always wants to have. We have shifted the debate and we are forcing Israel to defend itself. Uh, the fact that they're sending 100 envoys, I think, is a huge victory for the boycott divestment sanctions movement and Israeli Apartheid Week in particular. Uh, sadly, some of these envoys are Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I think it's important to, uh, to speak about that and not, not shy away from it, because the Israeli state likes to use Palestinian citizens who will speak about how glorious it is. And to me, uh, that is the effects of apartheid. It's that you become so internally colonized uh, that you can start to go out into the world and become an ambassador for the state that's actually oppressing you. Uh, yesterday in Nottingham there were a few of them that attended the lecture and I said this, I said no matter what happens you're Palestinian, you're, you're, you're part of the Palestinian people, I don't condone what you are doing but I understand that this is the result of apartheid and this is what it has done to you. So I'm glad they're training people, uh, we are very ready and open for the debate. Um, yesterday they booked a room right next to where we were speaking, uh, they didn't engage within questions and I don't necessarily understand their strategy because it's failing in the sense that they're not an announcing their events. Um, it seems like an exercise in Israeli propaganda that's done to benefit the Israeli ministry to say that we have done something. Uh, and like their institutions are saying, there's a huge difference between working from the grassroots up and having activists on the ground versus having your ministry, ministry train people. That doesn't work within student activism. And they're not winning the case on campuses. They're really losing the case on campuses. So I'm, I'm glad they came. Uh, I'm glad they got the training. To me, it looks like an utter and complete failure. And like I was saying yesterday, I'm glad they get paid to do the work they do. But it says a lot, the fact that hundreds and hundreds of Palestine solidarity activists do this from the conviction of the justice of the Palestinian cause, not because they're getting a paycheck from a ministry. Paranoia is the permanent, uh, is the permanent state of Israel. It's a permanent state of any unjust system. It is permanently paranoid because they know that they are wrong. They know it in their hearts that they are wrong. Uh, uh, now, the other fear in here is, has to do with this public opinion. Uh, that we, we, we have to engage in. Uh, I, think, I think it shows, I mean, uh, uh, certainly. The thing is, uh, unlike apartheid again here, South African apartheid, is that Zionism is an international you know, movement. They've got people everywhere 
uh, that work tirelessly to delegitimize our discourses. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, their days are numbered, and I think they can see it themselves. Their days are numbered. We will win. We are many. We will win. Uh, uh, and also because I think um, the, 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 the very efforts that they are doing are going to put more oil, more fuel into our efforts. So it is, it's the continuing uh, behavior of a state whose entire existence is uh, dependent on the destruction of the, of the other, uh, that is, is dependent on a racist ideology. Uh, so, uh, in my view, uh, that's what it shows. It shows that, uh, that they've got to do this. But in my view, I think I celebrate it uh, because uh, 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 then it fast tracks uh, our, our struggle, as it were. Yeah. Rafif, you're Palestinian, but you live outside Palestine. So, do you consider yourself a refugee? And what would you say to people that say that Resolution 194 uh, the right of return for Palestinian refugees uh, doesn't apply to people like yourself. I'll start with this. Uh, I really resent it when people call us the refugee question, the refugee problem. Uh, it's as if we are cargo, and it, it really reminds me of how people would have spoken about slavery, cargo ships, to, as if we're not human. Um, I'm a Palestinian refugee. Originally, my family is from Haifa, refugees to Lebanon. Uh, my grandparents died in a refugee camp in Lebanon essentially because my grandfather didn't want to leave. He was saying, we need to stay in these camps because we will return to Palestine one day. Um, it's not, for me, it's not even a question of Resolution 194. It's not a question of international law. It's a simple question of justice uh, and the history of my own family and the history of generations of women within my family uh, who have taught me what Palestine is and that we have a homeland somewhere to return to. Uh, the fact that there is a UN Resolution 194, that's, that's great. Uh, I'm not a legal scholar, uh, but I know my own history, and I know that I may not return to Haifa, but my children have a right to return to Haifa. The Zionist narrative is that Palestinians just got up uh, and left one day. In my talk in Nottingham yesterday, I said, let's even, even if we acknowledge that logic and say all Palestinians decided to go have coffee uh, in neighboring countries, why would we not have a right to return? And what is it that people are so afraid of with people like myself saying we want to return. What are we protecting? Uh, it's supposed to be this uh, Zionist uh, entity that's supposed to be exclusive, and we want to be protecting that. So the, the debate isn't about Resolution 194, uh, the, where the comma goes in Resolution 194, whether it applies to me or not. My, my question is, what are you protecting when you say, let's not talk about the right of return? You're protecting a racist state that wants to stay in ethnic exclusivity. And people should be against that, whether there's a 194, 1,000 billion for, people should be against that type of racism. What would you say to people that say that we need to convince public opinion with arguments that they're ready to accept? Do you think it's the way the movement should go? Or do you think we should try to, not to convince them, but to change them with, uh, with you know, justice, equality, and, 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 and freedom? I think in general, you can say that the role of human rights activists, uh, the role of people who want to put forward a vision of how things could be rather than what they are now, is to challenge and shape the existing opinion. You know? And uh, all sorts of different justice movements uh, in many different contexts have had to start from a position uh, where public opinion is um, very far off uh, the end goal or is in a position where there has to be a lot of work to, to, to bring public opinion around to an issue. But when you're campaigning on a, on a, particular, on a particular struggle, you don't, really, you don't let that dissuade you from wanting to arrive at the ultimate end goal that, that, you're, that you're going for. Um, of course, you still then have to be strategic about how you get there, but where you're going remains the same. Um, and you want to bring the public along with you, but how can you challenge a public unless you have a vision that is um, something bold and different from what they're hearing already? I have a problem with this idea of we need to start with the, what's pragmatic and what Israel will accept. Because the social justice movements and movements for freedom and liberation don't start with what the occupier is willing to accept. 
they start with justice. For me as a Palestinian, I start with what is just for myself and for my family and for my people, not what some scholar somewhere has been reading about us. Uh, with all due respect to scholars who study us, uh, but we're not rats in a lab to be studied. Uh, there is, we start with justice and what that means for Palestinians and we go from there. Uh, you don't change your demands and you don't change what is justice because that's what people will accept. And we work on a grassroots level. I'm all for pragmatism when it comes to how we organize our BDS campaigns, how we put forward our demands. But the simple questions of justice and the right of return, the pragmatism about that is to speak of justice. And that's, that's the starting point for me at least. And I know that for the majority of Palestinian refugees, that's the starting point. Uh, and I fully agree with the way you were framing the question. I think uh, we don't start from this is what international laws is telling us only, but what is it that we're defending? What is this ethnic exclusivity? Shouldn't we question that? And I don't know why people are afraid to question it, especially people like Finkelstein who have suffered consequences of, of what they say, but suddenly, all of a sudden, he's stopping at what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, uh, and saying, this is where public opinion stands. Well, I'm interested in moving public opinion, and we're succeeding in moving public opinion, and that's what we should be looking at, how to move that public opinion.